Greetings, all. Welcome to Aquarian Diary. I'm your host, John Irving. It is October 10th, 2023. The bulk of this was recorded on October 8th. Today, I will primarily talk about something that has been stuck at the forefront of my mind for about a week in terms of things I want to talk about here. Before I get to that, though, most people in the world are likely aware of what happened in Israel on the weekend, a terrible tragedy. At that time, Mars was conjuncting the south node in Libra, opposing the north node in Aries, of course, and tightly squaring Pluto in Capricorn, so a T-square involving Pluto, Mars, and the nodes. I also want to draw your attention to this Libra solar eclipse, this new moon eclipse, which is occurring on October 14th, a few days from now. Eclipses can bring sudden, intense events to areas that they influence. In mundane astrology, the seventh house, which is ruled by Libra, and its ruling planet Venus, governs things like diplomacy and open enemies. These are enemies that you know exist, as opposed to the twelfth house, which traditionally ruled hidden enemies, which are enemies you have, but you don't know you have them, or you can't identify them. So here we see this dramatic, unexpected event that relates to a complete failure or breakdown of diplomacy, perhaps triggered by the violent and explosive energy of Mars squaring Pluto, and involving the nodes, which are very karmic points. Like I said, it's surprising, it's dramatic, and this event is certainly one that will be noteworthy historically, where relations will never be the same going forward. In fact, I find it quite surprising that nobody predicted this or saw it coming, given its incredibly significant implications geopolitically and historically. I personally find this very horrible and unfortunate tragedy difficult to contemplate. It's very disturbing. In personal astrology, Libra and the seventh house, where the October 14th eclipse is occurring, govern our own close relationships, typically committed ones, as well as business partnerships, and in negative expression, our detractors or quote-unquote enemies. So bear that in mind. We also have, <laughs> at the same time, and I've done a whole episode on this, we have the North Node transiting Aries and the South Node transiting Libra, which I believe plays into this as well. Aries, of course, is ruled by Mars. Mars is the god of war. So it's not surprising to see dramatic expressions of aggression because that is the lower expression of Mars and a diminishment, south node, of diplomacy. In fact, there's a lot of diplomatic breakdowns that have been occurring recently, even with China, for example, or India, or the BRIC nations. Countries and leaders are striking out independently, Mars, and a lot of traditional geopolitical policies and alliances are being tested. Rash behavior is not unexpected. As usual, I will be putting links in the episode description to other episodes where I go into some of these topics in more detail. But the North Node entered Aries on July 17th of 2023 and will be transiting Aries until January 11th of 2025. In the episode prior to this one, I mentioned the two eclipses in October. The second is a lunar eclipse on October 28th at 5 degrees of Taurus. And I also talked about the major retrograde cycles. And quickly, I want to point out here again, just to refresh your memory, that Pluto goes direct on October 10th, and then Saturn goes direct on November 4th. So those are coming up fairly quickly. Neptune will be going direct on December 6th, and Jupiter won't be going direct until December 30th. Those are major shifts that will be occurring by the end of the year. 
when planets are retrograde, think of it like going back and double checking your path or your progress. Retrogrades give us an opportunity to review or revisit, to make adjustments in our path or direction before we proceed forward again. This can be very, very useful. It's kind of like clearing up loose ends. And so it's not surprising that a lot of the issues that we've been seeing playing out in the media, and there are many, it's been incredibly intense from a news and current events perspective. There have been many, many things that are coming to the surface that really need to be addressed in many dimensions of society, politics, human experience, and so forth. When these planets start moving forward again, there will be more of an energy for problem solving and implementing fixes. Right now, there's a lot of energy going into backtracking a bit, questioning and revisiting topics, as I said, giving us a chance to make course corrections before the energy start moving ahead again. Now, we're still going to have Pluto at 29 degrees of Capricorn, which is a really big deal, and I also did a whole episode on that as well. I don't like to be redundant, so I'm not going to repeat all of that. You can check the episode description if you want to consider that. So finally, back to my original mission here. I have done a couple episodes talking about a lot of the radical kind of experiences, politically and socially, that we have been witnessing in recent years, trying to put them into a historic context. I'll link those in the description as well. But I want to express one of those slightly differently, because sometimes it helps to look at things from a slightly different perspective. And that is the transit of Uranus through Taurus. Uranus has been transiting Taurus since 2018 and will complete its transit in 2026. And for various reasons, I have pinpointed the time frame of 2026 for the end of a lot of the chaos we've been experiencing. I'm not going to repeat all that either here right now. But the aspect of this transit that I want to focus on a little differently is just that most people associate Taurus in mundane terms, or big picture terms, with property, banking, finance, money, possessions, real estate, and the like. But on another level, Taurus also represents what we value. Money is an abstract representation of our value. Why is one thing worth a lot more than something else? That's because people value it, obviously. Or something may be more valuable because it's more rare, whether it's a mineral, a piece of fine art, a property, a car, whatever it is. Uranus can represent dramatic events and dramatic changes, things that occur suddenly, things that are out of step with the past, things that are radical, extreme, or completely unexpected. It can be shocking, and sometimes it can be so shocking that it actually causes trauma (laughs) because it literally breaks up patterns that we may have clung to. So when we think about, for example, what's happened with banking and finance and money and the stock market, real estate and housing, and things like inflation over recent years, It has been truly shocking. A lot of norms and patterns that people predicted and expected were completely upended, and in some cases, shattered. And the same can be said for our values. We have seen an incredible rise of really extreme and radical values and expressions of those. A lot of it has been incredibly shocking. That is a fact. (laughs) If you read the news, You can find completely jaw-dropping, shocking things on almost a daily basis. That's what I experience. This can be quite stressful and anxiety-inducing because you don't know what to expect next. And a lot of these things are outside of what anyone predicted would occur. So they're very surprising. This is very Uranian. My point is that we can expect this all the way through 2026. We get a brief reprieve between July and November of 2025. That'll give us a taste of what the new normal is going to look like. But things will start to settle down in some ways then. Then Uranus is going to transit Gemini from 2025 through 2033. Now in mundane astrology, the third house, 
which is what Gemini rules, governs communication, short forms of transportation, a country's neighbors, that would be countries that are adjacent to them, and local commerce. So in some ways, it includes the internet, because the internet is a form of communication, and we also use it for commerce. But it's more like your local community, as opposed to your country. It's your town, your village, your neighborhood. And it includes the media, because the media is all about communication. Now, you can expand this tent as large as you want, because there are many, many expressions of these kinds of activities. But we can expect, for example, a lot of changes during that time, from 2025 to 2033, about how communities function, and there will be probably a lot of shake-up and transformation in news, publishing, communications, the media, any form of expression that conveys knowledge or information, even film or art. Local commerce will probably go through a lot of radical changes. And there will probably be a lot of involvement with technology and the internet with all of this. The news media is already in a state of crisis. There are many, many traditional publications which have really been struggling with how to survive in a digital age. And so there is a dearth of local reporting in many cases, which is really unfortunate for a lot of obvious reasons. And I think we're going to see a huge shift in transportation. So electric vehicles, for example, electric cars and trucks, community-based transportation, public transportation, all of those kinds of things are going to be up for radical evolution and change. Now, Uranus can manifest quite shockingly, as I've explained. So a lot of these changes are not necessarily going to be received as being beneficial by everybody. A lot of this stuff that will occur will be upsetting. I expect that many of these issues will pertain to environmental issues, like think about what's happening, for example, with the Mississippi River and New Orleans right now, where suddenly they're finding out that their water supply is being contaminated by saltwater intrusion because of drought and sea level rise. So there may not be a lot of stability within the boundaries of traditional communities whether it's a town or village, the suburbs, whatever. By now, we're all aware of these really unprecedented extreme weather events that have been really devastating to a lot of communities around the globe, whether it's floods or wildfires or smoke or drought. Even now, insurance companies are starting to pull out of a lot of these markets and even if it's available, insurance is becoming insanely expensive. So this makes people vulnerable and puts them and their properties and their communities at risk. We know that the climate situation will worsen for years to come, even under the best case scenarios. Uranus can fracture things. I've seen that in my own personal experience with significant Uranus transits to my personal planets. And like I've said before, it can be traumatic. So with Uranus in the sector of communities, I think that those kinds of things are probably going to reach a completely different level. And because Uranus breaks things up, we may start to see people being displaced and dealing with all of the stress and anxiety about that, where we find that these communities that have been a place of refuge for generations no longer feel secure or safe. For some reason, the suburbs came to my mind a lot while I was thinking about this. You know, I hate to say this because I'm a fan of the country, but we might start to realize that we are quite vulnerable in rural settings where we don't have as much infrastructure or as many municipal services under these kinds of conditions. I'm going out on a bit of a limb here, but whatever it is, community and community life will be disrupted and changed and broken up in some ways. Living situations may be more transient or less permanent than what we're familiar with. Another possibility would be, say, homes get a lot smaller. 
so they change a lot in size, or maybe they are mobile. And a lot of this may relate to commerce and the way that commerce is conducted on a local level. We know that there has been a huge consolidation of power and ownership in many, many sectors of the economy, whether it's grocery store chains, agribusiness, meat processing, sales, whatever. There will be a lot of stress and strain and changes and things are going to be breaking in a lot of those areas. And like I said, there will certainly be changes that were not expected. It could also be, for example, that there are new forms of energy, maybe that are distributed, where people are producing their own energy at home, which leads them to be less dependent on utilities or the power grid. That would be very Uranian and technology-driven, which is a Uranian thing. And like I said, there could be tremendous breakthroughs with transportation. For example, batteries with really significant range capabilities could suddenly become available at a much cheaper price, which would completely upend the entire automotive industry. It's already being dramatically altered, but this would take it to a whole new level and it would occur much more quickly. Or maybe driverless or autonomous vehicles take off to the point where they become a major form of transportation for people. It could be that it's much cheaper to use them than it is to buy or lease a vehicle because they will just show up whenever you need them and you don't have the monthly lease or bank loan expense and all the other costs associated with owning a vehicle, like maintenance. And a lot of people could adopt that because vehicles are a major expense for people. That also would have really important implications for us as individuals, for our communities, and for the automotive and transportation industry, which in many cases are locally owned enterprises that could become redundant overnight. Truck drivers are a classic example. And also for the government, because they generate a lot of tax revenue from vehicles, highways, driving infractions, vehicle licensing fees, and so on. And how do governments tax labor that's done by machines or computers? These are the kind of disruptions we should probably anticipate. The technology is there, it just needs to reach a level of maturity. Those kinds of changes would have profound implications. I would expect to see in the publishing and news industry that a lot of things are going to make a shift into being truly digital during this time. And whatever happens with the news and media will likely be something that nobody really fully anticipated. There might have been a few people who saw it coming, but the vast majority of people won't have seen this coming. One possibility that might fit into these energies might be a lot of journalists operating independently because Uranus doesn't like boundaries. And that's already kind of starting to happen with podcasting. The current generation of AI is advancing at an unbelievable pace. And it has the potential to displace countless jobs in fields like the media and publishing and journalism. But beyond that, Combining AI with robotics could render millions of jobs obsolete, which would devastate communities. We would either have completely unprecedented unemployment rates akin to the Great Depression, or the government is going to have to step in and offer some form of universal basic income. Internet connectivity itself, right to your home, could also be revolutionized, such that it becomes available to people even if they're, for example, in far-flung places. We already have satellite connectivity, but that could dramatically expand and become more broadly available or ubiquitous. Like, for example, imagine if satellite connectivity was built right into your laptop as a standard thing, where you don't need a wired connection or even Wi-Fi anymore. There will also likely be a lot of really significant developments with things like computing and cell phone technology. 
We think our phones are pretty sophisticated right now, and they most certainly are compared to what they were like a decade ago. But the proliferation of them and their capabilities will likely go through really profound evolution during this time. This whole notion of us being digitally connected will be taken to completely different levels. It might even mean, for example, that things like electronic voting takes hold, where we can weigh in on things almost instantaneously. Digital currencies is another thing. Many people may not realize this, but China is moving very, very quickly towards a purely digital technology for its currency, for day-to-day -day use. This is the third house. In fact, even people on the street in China who, for example, beg for money need to have smartphones because people don't have cash. So that's really good in some ways because it reduces a lot of middlemen. Like when your employer pays you, the money is instantaneously in your account. When you purchase something, it instantaneously goes from you to someone else and there's fewer middlemen. Like credit card companies, <laughs> for example may not welcome this because they charge a lot of fees on transactions. But if you can make a payment instantaneously with no middleman, what do you need them for? Think about that. It has huge implications. The downsides are that the Chinese government can monitor every single transaction by everyone in the country at any point in time. That is really scary. If someone is critical of the Chinese government, they can be cut off from making financial transactions, which basically would bankrupt them. So this can be a very powerful tool of autocratic control and oppression. So there's potential for abuse, but there's also upsides to it. Now that's going to put pressure on the United States to also move forward with this technology because they don't want to be left behind. China is not a direct threat yet in terms of America's reserve currency, but the U.S. cannot ignore the trends. So I would not be surprised to see this become a major theme for, for example, the European Union and the United States and other major countries to start seriously implementing digital currencies, for better or for worse. Because we use currencies in our commerce, day-to-day -day commerce. That's the third house. As someone who has been very involved in internet and internet technology for many years, I don't even like raising the prospect of this, but I would not be surprised to see a lot of battles over control of the internet and the role of journalism and the media during this cycle. There may very well be attempts by various governments to try and rein in internet activity. Even if some of it is well-intentioned, it may have unforeseen and unexpected consequences, and there could be a lot of battles over that. The government may think that it needs to put its foot down, but at what cost? I am a huge advocate of free speech. There's a fine line between free speech and irresponsible or dangerous speech. Now, clearly those that cross that line have to be held accountable, but that is a very slippery slope. We're already seeing that begin here in Canada, where the government is trying to implement legislation that many people find very concerning and troubling. And others are arguing that, well, we need to do something about it. But the question is, what do you do? And who are the gatekeepers? And who are the gatekeepers aligned with? It's a very complicated, tricky issue, and very few countries in the world even anticipated these kinds of problems, much less what forms of legislation would address them without stepping on people's freedoms. The flip side of that might be that we have much greater privacy laws and digital protections. It would also not be surprising to see large monopolies in the tech space being taken to task for unfair business practices. For example, Uranus can break things up. Some of these discussions are already underway with, for example, Google in the United States, as well as Amazon. 
which are being accused of monopolistic and predatory practices. Now, one other thing that's really important to note here is that Uranus in Taurus will be trining Pluto in Aquarius the whole time that it's in Gemini. This is really important. The trine is the most harmonious or easy flowing aspect in astrology. The energies, in fact, can flow so smoothly that we take them for granted. But what that means is that this relationship between Pluto and Uranus, two of the big players, will be very harmonious and the energy will flow incredibly easily. It's like the volume knob is turned all the way up and there's very little resistance between the two. Pluto, representing change and transformation, death and rebirth, is going to be in this very powerful, harmonious aspect to Uranus and Gemini for this whole six or seven year period. And so these kinds of changes that I'm talking about are going to be flowing very powerfully and without a lot of obstruction. It doesn't mean that we as people are going to find that easy because change is just going to be happening so fast and so constantly that it'll be hard to keep up with. And people, generally, some more than others, like things to be predictable. But in many ways, they won't be. Of course, I did a huge episode on Pluto and Aquarius, which is really about this shift in consciousness to more of a global level, where we have a trend towards global egalitarianism and connectedness and awareness. The breakdown of the smaller tribes, more of a focus on us as a species and our place in the world. And Aquarius is very intelligent and rational, generally. So think about how this effect is going to play out for us, like on a community level in our day to day lives. It has really big implications if you take all the things I've been talking about and meld them together. So there will be a surge of change and evolution in a very forward-looking, rational, and globally conscious egalitarian perspective. Now, Pluto will be showing us the negative sides of Aquarius because it has to purge. It has to purge the darkness, the garbage. It will be bringing that to our attention wherever we're not expressing the energies of Aquarius or the 11th house authentically. So we're definitely going to have challenges, but the overriding agenda will be to purge all of those false expressions of Aquarius so that we can manifest the accurate and positive expressions of it. So we're going to see how governments and organizations and groups and groupthink and nations and tribalism are expressed in its lowest expression or in ways that are antithetical to Aquarius on a higher level so that we can get past that. It's really about what we want the future to look like. Pluto transits are never easy, <laughs> but they can be profoundly transformative. And sometimes old ways of being and old ways of thinking need to die so that new ones can take their place. It's very regenerative. But there can be that metaphorical death part of the cycle, and there often is. The third house, or where Uranus will be transiting in Gemini, is a mutable house, meaning that it is more adaptive and flexible about changes, and is capable of seeing things from different perspectives. So the overall trend won't be necessarily as dramatic, perhaps, as it was in the fixed sign of Taurus. And of course, yes, in the third house, Uranus is in trine to the house that it rules. On a personal level, if you have significant planets or points in Gemini, you're going to be experiencing a lot of very noteworthy and sometimes sudden developments or changes. While in Gemini, Uranus will be squaring Pisces and Virgo and opposing Sagittarius. Those are all very significant aspects as well. So whatever planets or points, like your ascendant or midheaven, are in aspects of square, opposition, or conjunction to Uranus, things will happen, and they can be quite intense and disruptive and forever change the course of matters that pertain to those 
planets or points or houses. As I've mentioned, Uranus will be trining Aquarius and Libra during this time, and sextiling Aries and Leo. Those are the more easy-flowing energies or aspects. You'll have to check your chart for more details on how this transit will play out for you. So that's a bit of what you can expect when Uranus moves from the values area into the communication and community area. And again, this is local community, not global community. So there's a transformation happening on the global scale, which is Pluto, as well as how that percolates down to and expresses and manifests in our local communities. However it plays out, you can expect it to be dramatic and unexpected and sometimes shocking. But at least by then, we won't be dealing with the radical extreme expressions of values that we've been seeing relentlessly for years now, to the point where even democracies are under direct threat, where it seemed like the genie was let out of the bottle with respect to our psychology around values. A lot of people were saying the quiet part out loud, which is pretty shocking because they're not supposed to do that, even if that's how they feel on the inside. That cycle will be finishing in the next few years. So that's what I wanted to say. This is a lot longer than I thought it would be, but I guess that's just how long it takes to express these things. Again, for more detail, check the episode description for other episodes that are related or that I mentioned. And if you're interested in a reading with me, I'll put a link to that as well. A natal or transit reading makes a great gift, by the way. It's something people won't forget. Many sincere thanks to everyone who supports me, especially my YouTube members. Thank you very much. Take care, all the best, and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye for now.